The Varieties of Religious Experience, a Study in Human Nature by William James, continues with probably lecture 16, the, you know, mysticism, um, but lectures 16 and 17 are mixed together here. Nitrous oxide and ether, especially nitrous oxide, when sufficiently diluted with air, stimulate the mystical consciousness in an extraordinary degree. Depth beyond depth of truth seems revealed to the inhaler. This truth fades out, however, or escapes at the moment of coming to, and if any words remain over in which it seemed to clothe itself, they prove to be the veriest nonsense. Nevertheless, the sense of a profound meaning having been there persists, and I know more than one person who is persuaded that in the nitrous oxide trance we have a genuine metaphysical revelation. Now, intoxication aside, it's sort of undeniable that there is real perception that occurs in the drug state. And some of that's even beyond mind stuff, right? Some years ago, I made myself some observations on this aspect of nitrous oxide intoxication and reported them in print. One conclusion was forced upon my mind that at that time and my impression of its truth has never since remained unshaken. It is that our normal waking consciousness, rational consciousness, as we call it, is but one special type of consciousness. Whilst all about it, parted from it, by the filmiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. We may go through life without suspecting their existence but apply the requisite stimulus, and, at a touch, they are there in all their completeness, definite types of mentality, which probably somewhere have their field of application and adaptation. No account of the universe in its totality can be final, which leaves these other forms of consciousness quite disregarded. How to regard them is the question, for they are so discontinuous with ordinary consciousness, yet they may determine attitudes though they cannot furnish formulas, and open a region, though they fail to give a map. At any rate, they forbid a premature closing of our accounts with reality. Looking back up on my own experiences, they all converge towards a kind of insight to which I cannot help ascribing some metaphysical significance. The keynote of it is invariably a reconciliation. It is as if the opposites of the world whose contradictoriness and conflict make all our difficulties and troubles were melted into unity. Not only do they as contrasted species belong to one and the same genius, but one of the species, the nobler and better one, is itself the genius, and so soaks up and absorbs its opposite into itself. This is a dark saying, I know, when thus expressed in terms of common logic, but I cannot wholly escape from its authority. I feel as if it must mean something, something like what the Hegelian philosophy means. If one could only lay hold of it more clearly, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. To me, the living sense of its reality only comes in the artificial, mystic state of mind. What a reader of Hegel can doubt that sense of a perfected being with all its otherness soaked up into itself, which dominates his whole philosophy, must have come from the promise in his consciousness of mystical moods like this, and most persons kept subliminal. The notion is thoroughly characteristic of the mystical level, and the Aufgabe of making it articulate was sure to set Hegel's intellect by mystical feeling. I just now spoke of friends who believe in the an aesthetic revelation, for them, too, it is a monistic insight, in which the other and its various forms appears absorbed into the one. 
And this pervading genius, writes one of them, we pass forgetting and forgotten, and thenceforth each is all in God. There is no higher, no deeper, no other than the life in which we are founded. The one remains, the many change and pass, and each and every one of us is the one that remains. This is the ultimatum, as sure as being whence is all our care, so sure is content beyond duplexity at the thesis our trouble, where I have triumphed in a solitude that God is not above. Benjamin Paul Blood, the anesthetic revelation and the gist of philosophy, Amsterdam, New York, 1874, pages 35 and 36, Mr. Blood has made several attempts to enumerate the anesthetic revelation in pamphlets of rare literary distinction, privately printed and distributed by himself at Amsterdam, Zenas Clark, a philosopher who died young at Amherst in the 80s, much lamented by those who knew him, was also impressed by the revelation. In the first place, he once wrote to me, Mr. Blood, and I agree that the revelation is, if anything, non-emotional. It is utterly flat. It is, as Mr. Blood says, the one sole and sufficient insight why or why not, why but how, the present is pushed on by the past and sucked forward by the vacuity of the future. Its inevitableness defeats all attempts at stopping or accounting for it. It is all precedents and presuppositions, and the questioning is, in regard to it, forever too late. It is an initiation of the past. The secret would be the formula by which the now keeps exfoliating out of itself, yet never escapes. What is it, indeed, that keeps existence exfoliating? The formal being of anything, the logical definition of it, is static. For mere logic, every question contains its own answer. We simply fill the hole with dirt we dug out. Why are twice two four? Because, in fact, four is twice two. Thus logic finds in life no propulsion, only a momentum. It goes because it is a going. But, the revelation adds, it goes because it is and was a going. You walk as if it were round yourself in the revelation. Ordinary philosophy is like a hound hunting his own trail. The more he hunts, the farther he has to go, and his nose never catches up with his heels, because it is forever ahead of them. So, the present is already a foregone conclusion, and I am ever too late to understand it. But at the moment of recovery from anesthesis, just then, before starting on life, I catch, so to speak, a glimpse of my heels, a glimpse of the eternal process just in the act of starting. The truth is that we travel on a journey that was accomplished before we set out, and the real end of philosophy is accomplished, not when we arrive at, but when we remain in our destination, being already there, which may occur vicariously in this life when we cease our intellectual questioning. That is, when there is a smile upon the face of the revelation as we view it, it tells us that we are forever half a second too late, that's all. You could kiss your own lips and have all the fun to yourself, it says, if you only knew the trick. It would be perfectly easy if they would just stay there till you got round to them. Why don't you manage it somehow? Of course, that's the temptation of the of the mystic that can bring about the states, right? Because um, they can bring such states in themselves, usually without drugs. And you know, why do we? Uh, why do they need the other human beings, right? Dialectically minded readers of this far ago will at least recognize the region of thought by which Mr. Clark writes as familiar in his latest pamphlet, Tennyson's Trances and the Anesthetic Revelation. Mr. Blood describes its value for life as follows. The Anesthetic Revelation is the initiation of man into the immemorial mystery of the open secret of being revealed as the ineffable vortex of continuity. Inevitable is the word. Its motive is inherent. It is what has to be. It is not for any love or hate, nor for joy or sorrow, nor good nor ill, end, beginning, or purpose it knows not of. 
It affords no particular of the multiplicity and variety of things, but it fills appreciation of the historical and sacred with the secular and intimately personal illumination of the nature and motive of existence, which then seems reminiscent as if it should have appeared or should yet appear to every participant thereof. Although it is at first startling in its solemnity, it becomes directly such a matter of course, so old-fashioned and so akin to Proverbs that it inspires exultation rather than fear and a sense of safety as identified with the aboriginal and the universal. But no words may express the imposing certainty of the patient that he is realizing the primordial. Atomic surprise of life, repetition of the experience, finds it ever the same, and as if it could not possibly be otherwise, the subject resumes his normal consciousness only to partially and fitfully remember its occurrence and try to formulate its baffling import. With only this consolidatory afterthought, that he has known the oldest truth, and that he has done with human theories as to the origin, meaning our destiny of the race, he is beyond instruction in spiritual things. The lesson is one of central safety. The kingdom is within. There's a lot of ambiguity with the term race back here, right? Um... The lesson is one central safety. The kingdom is within. All days are judgment days, but there can be no climacteric purpose of eternity, nor any scheme of the whole. The astronomer abridges the row of bewildering figures by increasing his unit of measurement. So may we reduce the distracting multiplicity of things to the unity for which each of us stands. This has been my moral sustenance since I have known of it. In my first printed mention of it, I declared, the world is no more than alien terror that was taught me, spurning the cloud grim and still sultry battlements, whence so lately Jehovah thunders, boomed my gray gull lifts her wing against the nightfall, and takes the dim leagues with a fearless eye, and now after twenty-seven years of this experience, the wing is grayer, but the eye is fearless still, while I renew and doubly emphasize that declaration, I know as having known the meaning of existence, the same center of the universe, at once the wonder and the assurance of the soul, for which the speech of reason has yet to name, but the anesthetic revelation. I have considerably abridged the quotation, and... Oh, okay. This has the genuine religious mystical ring. I just now quoted J.A. Simmons. He also records a mystical experience with chloroform as follows. After the choking and stifling had passed away, I seemed at first in a state of utter blankness. Then came flashes of intense light alternating with blackness and with a keen vision of what was going on in the room around me, but no sensation of touch. I thought that I was near death when suddenly my soul became aware of a God who was manifestly dealing with me, handling me, so to speak, in an intense personal present reality. I felt him streaming in like light upon me. I cannot describe the ecstasy I felt. Then, as I gradually awoke from the influence of the anesthetics, the old sense of my relation to the world began to return. The new sense of my relation to God began to fade. I suddenly leapt to my feet on the chair where I was sitting and shrieked out, It is too horrible. It is too horrible. It is too horrible, meaning that I could not bear this disillusionment. Then I flung myself on the ground and at last awoke covered with blood, calling to the two surgeons who were frightened. Why did you not kill me? Why would you not let me die? Only think of it, to have felt for that long, dateless ecstasy of vision, the very God in all purity and tenderness and truth and absolute love, and then to find that I had, after all, had no revelation, but that I had been tricked by the abnormal excitement of my brain. Yet, this question remains. Is it possible that the inner sense of reality which succeeded when my flesh was dead to impressions from without, to the ordinary sense of physical relations, was not a delusion, but an actual experience. 
Is it possible that I, in that moment, felt what some of the saints have said? They always felt the undemonstrable but irrefragable certainty of God. I've decided page 40, uh, page 78 to 80, abridged. I subjoin also by abridging it, another interested and aesthetic revelation communicated to me in a manuscript by a friend in England. The subject, a gifted woman, was taking ether for a surgical operation. I wondered if I was in a prison being tortured, and why I remembered having heard it said that people learn through suffering. And in view of what I was seeing, the inadequacy of this saying struck me so much that I said aloud, to suffer is to learn. With that, I became unconscious again, and my last dream immediately preceded my real coming to. It only lasted a few seconds, and was most vivid and real to me, though it may not be clear in words. A great being or power was traveling through the sky. His foot was on a kind of lightning as a wheel on a rail. It was his pathway. The lightning was made entirely of the spirits of innumerable people close to one another, and I was one of them. He moved in a straight line, and each part of the straight or flash came into its short conscious existence only that he might travel. I seemed to be directly under the foot of God, and I thought that he was grinding his own life up out of my pain. Then I saw that what he had been trying with all his might to do was to change his course, to bend the line of lightning to which he was tied in the direction in which he wanted to go. I felt my flexibility and helplessness and knew that he would succeed. He bended me, turning his corner by means of my hurt, hurting me more than I had ever been hurt in my life, and at the acutest point of this, as he passed, I saw, I understood for a moment things that I have now forgotten, things that, ha that no one could remember while retaining sanity. The angle was an obtuse angle, and I remember thinking as I woke that he had made it a right or acute angle. I should have both suffered and seen still more, and should probably have died. He went on, and I came to. In that moment, the whole of my life passed before me, including each little meaningless, meaningless piece of distress, and I understood them. This was what it had all meant. This was the piece of work it had been contributing to do. I did not see God's purpose. I only saw his intentness and his entire relentlessness towards his means. He thought, no more of me than a man thinks of hurting a cork when he is opening wine or hurting a cartridge when he is firing. And yet, on waking, my first feeling was, and it came with tears, Domni non sum digna, for I had been lifted into a position for which I was too small. I realized that in the, that half an hour under ether, I had served God more distinctly and purely than I had done in my life before, or then I am capable of desiring to do. I was the means of his achieving and revealing something I know not what are to whom and that to the exact extent of my capacity for suffering while regaining consciousness I wondered why since I had gone so deep I had seen nothing of what the saints call the love of God nothing but his relentlessness and then I heard an answer which I could only just catch saying knowledge and love are one and the measure is suffering I give the words as they came to me with that I came finally to into what seemed a dream world compared with the reality of what I was leaving, and I saw that what could be called the cause of my experience was a slight operation under insufficient ether in a bed pushed up against a window, a common city window in a common city street. If I had to formulate a few of the things I then caught a glimpse of, they would run somewhat as follows. The, etern the eternal necessity of suffering and its eternal vicariousness, the veiled and incommunicable and, and the incommunicable nature of the worst sufferings, the passivity of genius, how it is essentially instrumental and defenseless, move not moving, it must do what it does, the impossibility of discovery without its price, finally the excess of what the suffering seer or genius pays over what his generation gains. He seems like one who sweats his life out to earn enough to save a district from famine, and just as he staggers back, dying and satisfied, bringing a lack of bringing a lock of rupees to buy grain with. God lifts the lock away, dropping one rupee, and says, that you may give them that you have earned for them. The rest is for me. 
I perceived also in a way never to be forgotten the excess of what we see over what we can demonstrate, and so on. These things may seem to you delusions or truisms, but for me they are dark truths, and the power to put them into even such words as these has been given me by an ether dream. Certainly use your experiences thereof, right? With this, we make connection with religious mysticism pure and simple. Simmons' question takes us back to these to those examples which you will remember my quoting in the lecture on the reality of the unseen, of sudden realization of the immediate presence of God, the phenomenon in one shape or another is not uncommon. I know, writes Mr. Treen, an officer on our police force, who has told me that many times when off duty and on his way home in the evening, there comes to him.